Okay, who's next? Tom. Thank you, Mr. Tancredo, for coming visiting with us. I'm Tom Compton from La Plata Electric in the Durango area. <coughs> Would you share with us your position on Amendment 6061 and Proposition 101 and offer a brief explanation? Sure. Do you support or oppose? I do support them, and I'll tell you why. Um, one of the things that I think we have to do in this state is recognize the importance of having participation on the part of the people in the state in the taxation process. Um, m much of those deal with a problem that occurred as a result of people ignoring Tabor, for instance, bringing those, you know, creating taxes, putting taxes on a variety of different products and services that were defined by a court to be appropriate and not under Tabor, but in reality, I think any um, objective assessment of those things would tell you that indeed uh, they, were, they were taxes. I mean, a fee today has become a euphemism for a tax. Uh, and, and people think if they use the word, especially, especially politicians, think if they use the word fee, they indeed uh, will escape the, both the political consequences and even the legal consequences, Tabor in particular, of, uh, of, of doing what they're doing, which is taxing. So I believe that the, um, that the people of the state should have the opportunity to vote on that. This is one way they get to do it. Um, it also, it seems to me that when we, if we have the kind of dire consequences that are proposed uh, as a result of re the reduction of these taxes, then um, the people of the state recognizing that problem will address it. And you could do it, you could do it because it is a tax-related issue or a Tabor-related issue. You could do it next year. I mean, you could have another initiative next year if, if these things are as draconian. I don't believe they will have that same effect. I think that there, the effect will be to put the squeeze on government. And I see nothing really wrong with that. I don't believe our problems in Colorado stem from being undertaxed. Um, I, I do believe that the, I mean, if you look at what has happened even in state government, a 4,000 person increase in, in uh, the uh, employment of the state workers, uh, state employees, 4,000 over the last couple of years, and that is under a hiring freeze. <laughs> Could you imagine what would happen? If you didn't have a hiring freeze, how many people would have been hired? I mean, I don't know about you, but in, in your particular area, but I will tell you that I, I seldom come across any private enterprise that has had that kind of growth experience, that they had to hire 10% more people. Uh, it's worked the other way, as you both know. I mean, as you all know. And, and yet government can ignore that because it has the ability to come and take money away from you with the, the power of, of law. So um, it doesn't have the same sense of responsibility. Government doesn't. There are a myriad of ways we can address the problem of our budget. But again, I, I must tell you that it, it, it is in the way of mandates that we face these kinds of budgetary problems. And so to the extent that we can reduce or adjust those things, and we have to take them on, and they're going to, it's going to be tough. It's a broader picture, but you're saying, you asked me about something, you know, not necessarily inside the, the, the uh, context of energy right now, but the, um, the fact is that there are all kinds of things we can and should do as a state government to address the budgetary problems, and we can't. We just simply have chosen not to. One of the things you have to do is take on the unions. Um, you guys, that's a, that is a big, big problem. It's been there for a long time. Para is a huge problem. It's scary the extent to which that, that thing looms out there, 24 to $30 billion uh, unfunded liability. Where do you think that will come from? It's not, it's not the general fund. Last year, there was not a single dime for the first time in I don't know how long. I mean, I served in the legislature 30 years, 30 some years ago. And uh, we were there when, I was there when something called the Noble Bill went through, Dan Noble. 
was the author, and he put a tax on, uh, there was a tax that we put on, on goods that were sold for, uh, automotive, for automotive purposes, and, and we used that money. It went into the general fund, but it was used to uh, offset costs in the transportation area that we did not, costs that we could not uh, uh, handle with just the gas tax. But last year, there was not a penny that went in from the general fund to transportation, not a penny, because it all got sucked away by other mandated programs. This is a big problem, huge problem. And you have to address it. Well, how do you do that? You can pretend, you can kick the can down the road and pretend that it doesn't really matter, that um, you have a, uh, uh, no, we can, we can tinker with PARA, for instance, and pretend like this problem will go away. The legislature did that last year. That did not happen. It's not going to go away. It was just tinkering. Someone is going to have to really and truly go out. I mean, you're going to have to talk about not just uh, increasing the, the uh, uh, age for retirement, but there are a whole bunch of structural things that have to happen. And some of it's going to be legislative, some of it's going to be judicial, some of it we're going to have to go to court on, and some of it will have to be actually addressed through a constitutional uh, amendment. But all those things have to happen and somebody's got to lead that. Our problems, again, don't stem from being undertaxed, I don't think. Other questions? Jim. <laughs> Mr. Tan Crady, I'm Jim Lloyd, I'm a director from Highline Electric, uh, based out of Holyoke, Colorado. Uh, certainly appreciate you coming here today. Colorado currently has a renewable portfolio standard for investor-owned utilities at 30%. Mm. And for non-investor-owned utilities at 10%. All right. Would you support an increase in the RPS for non-investor-owned no. utilities? No, I would not. <laughs> I mean, again, look, it, it, somebody, in this case, you know, all right, they vote, but um, it, it just is so am amazing to me that, that we c keep thinking about our ability to correct some of these problems that we all know we have, pollution and, and all the rest of it, through actions like that, forcing some sort of arbitrary uh, a mandate on the industries. I mean, I started this whole thing by talking to you about the fact that I don't like those mandates. I, I really don't like them, and I certainly would not uh, support anything that, that uh, demands any more. Um, you know, this is an extra cost to the people who use your service. Um, if it could be justified through the marketplace, that's a different story entirely, but we all know it can't. We all know that you cannot possibly, I don't care how many times you want to vote, that we're all going to go to air or, um, or some other generation, uh, some other power generating activity, that everybody thinks that's a great, that'll be wonderful. Why don't we just do that? Air and solar. Then there'll be no more, it's like, it's like you know, the, the regulatory activity of the state um, that drove out all of the jobs on the Western Slope, especially the area of, of gas and oil production. Because we don't like it, because it doesn't, you know, it's just like, that's a, so ugly. We want other kinds of, uh, well, so, so what are the regulations? A, a company not too long ago, with which I became familiar, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I will, will just, <laughs> you just asked the wrong question there, I mean, or the right question, but just in terms of time thing. Uh, because I'm talking to this, this, this coal company, I mean, excuse me, oil uh, production company. It was over on the Western Slope. And, uh, and I think they're also in, involved with methane gas. Well, okay, so as you know, in the extraction of these minerals, always, always there's water as a byproduct. So what have we required in the past? We've required that, that water be put into these catch basins and then, uh, you know, something put underneath it so that it doesn't seep into the ground. They can evaporate and everybody's happy because actually nobody wants water, right, <laughs> over on the western slope or anywhere else. So let's just let it evaporate because God only knows what might be in there. Well, and in some cases there are problems, there are, there are harmful pollutants. So I understand. Okay, so they, they say that. Well, no, that's not good enough. Not good enough. You have to get rid of this water. Well, can you put it in the, in the river? No, you cannot put it. Can you let it go in the ground? No, you can't. Can we let it evaporate? No, you can't. Well, what exactly do you want us to do with the water that we have here? 
Well, you have to transport it to Utah. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yes, oh yeah, Utah. So you've got a truck. Now the, the company has to pay $40 a barrel to transport the water to Utah so they can evaporate it there. <laughs> what, how much, how much did it, now that, that doesn't, you know, figure in the, the uh, pollution that comes out of the diesel fuel used to move the stuff over to Utah. It's just, this is so idiotic and we see this all the time, all the time. Somebody making other decisions, some bureaucrat or, or politician making these kinds of decisions I recognize some, I'm not t talking about anarchy. I'm not talking about walking away from our responsibility to do what's necessary to try to provide a clean environment and allow, but, but there's got to be a balance. In this administration, both the governor and of course the legislature in both houses in the hands of Democrats, what do we expect? 